Well, good morning to you all again. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, yesterday, of course, was the 4th of July. And it was a, uh, it was a good 4th, I think. Um, the folks were watching fireworks, and I, I know that I was watching the night before uh, on television the, uh, the uh, celebration that was going on up in South Dakota. God bless South Dakota, by the way. So just so you all know, God's country. Um, and of course, I'm biased somewhat, slightly. Uh, at any rate, I, I was watching the, the uh, celebration there uh, that President Trump was doing before the monument, the monument with uh, the heads carved into the rock, and two of which, of course, uh, Washington and Jefferson are considered founding fathers. And we remember the founding fathers on the 4th of July, and we look back at the, the things that they achieved to give us this nation. Um, there is, unfortunately, at this point in time, a desire to judge the founding fathers and others uh, by the measure of perfection. Uh, perfect people, people that never made a mistake. Now, how many perfect people do we have here? So that's okay. I'm used to being alone in that. So um, I, I kid, um, honestly. But no, none of us are perfect. There was only one perfect person, and he was killed upon a cross, as we all know. But we do tend to want to, in today's anyway, judge people by a very unrealistic scale. Uh, no, no fault can be found, or else you are obliterate, obliterated uh, from from the from the conversation. Thankfully, and of course, we perhaps should be a little cautious. Perhaps the scripture will be next because. Here today we are in the book of Romans. A little further down from where I just did the reading in chapter 6, we are in chapter 7, verses 15 to 25, though we're going to be come backing up a little bit all the way into chapter 6 as we talk, probably. You never know exactly where I'm going when I start to talk. Um, I never know where I'm going. At um, any rate, we're looking at the words of Paul, of Tarsus. And of course, Paul was Saul and was, in his eyes, a very righteous man and perfect man, um, but he was persecuting uh, the church. And then he converted and became what was, for the Christian faith, undoubtedly the second most important figure behind Jesus Christ himself. And of course, I'm not sure that we can count Jesus because Jesus is God. So if we're looking at truly humans, uh, Paul, if we, we would be hard pressed to argue that anyone was more instrumental in this religion that we have than Paul. Most of the New Testament is either written by Paul or influenced by Paul, written by his disciples or people that uh, that had were were under his sway. Let's put it that way. Uh, so Paul's uh, impact upon this religion that we have uh, that we worship is un. It, it, it's unfathomable. I don't think we can truly appreciate it. But here in uh, Romans chapter 7, we're going to learn a little bit about Paul and was he perfect or was he not perfect? So let's listen to the, these words that no one can test uh, that I'm aware of. Or there's probably someone, but very few, if we we'll put it that way, doubt that Romans was written by Paul's hand. Uh, there are scriptures and letters attributed to Paul that are that are up for debate, but Romans is not one of them. So the, this is Paul writing about Paul. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my innermost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. Paul's not perfect. Sorry to break, to break it to you all. Paul was just as weak and as imperfect as any of us. Now we don't know exactly what Paul is talking about there as to what is the, 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 the evil that is, that is haunting him. Um, some draw an analogy to in 2 Corinthians where he talks about the thorn. In 2 Corinthians, uh, let's see, it would be in verse 7, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep, to keep me from being too elated. Some think that this, that this is part, that these two are uh, are connected somehow. We don't know. Paul doesn't elaborate on what the thorn is, nor does he elaborate on what the uh, uh, the thing that is attracting him to uh, to evil is. We don't know what that sin is. Um, but Paul talks a great deal about this shortcoming that he has and the fact that this sin drives him, uh, that it, it haunts him. And unfortunately, I think that all of us can, can relate to that. None of us are perfect. All of us have this daily battle, this daily thing, this minute by minute thing where we have to deal with, with temptation. And lest you think that, that, that Satan might think that any of us are above reproach, do you remember that thing about Christ in the wilderness? If he thought he could tempt Christ, do you think you're much of a challenge? Certainly not. So if you go about that without any backup, so to say, if you go out there and try to do it alone, I'm sorry to tell you, you will fall short. And we all fall short of the glory of God, but some will fall much shorter than others. You can't do it alone. We have to be together. We have to be there strengthening each other. We need to look back at the words that, that Paul has left with us. We need to take solace from this, understanding that Paul too struggled. But we don't ever use it as an excuse because that's one of the dangers of what Paul has written here in Romans uh, when he says that it's sin that dwells within me, but the sin, it's not I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me, he says in a couple places there. Um, that word that is translated as sin can also be translated as failure. But it's my failure that's within me. I fail. I come up short. Um, it's that empty spot in there where you don't have the strength. And there's only one place that you can get that. And Paul does tell us that at the end. Um, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For it is truly and surely only Christ that can save you from that. For you will all, and there goes one of my papers, two of them. Shouldn't have moved that rock. I might have had to have been. <laughs> Any rate, where was I? Um, all right, let's we, we'll regroup here. Um, Jesus talks about this thing that we're talking about, this sin, um, in John's Gospel in chapter eight. He says, Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. And Paul talked about that in that in chapter six that we just read before. Um, therefore, uh, let's see. Verse twenty-two. But now that you have been freed from sin and slave to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. That the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And in other parts of here, he talks about um, back in verse 15 or 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 
It's talking about being slaves to this this temptation. That we're slaves to that inner thing. Um, that, that the only freedom that we can have, and that's truly part of the about this, the uh, the uh, the substitutional sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Only through Him, because of what He's done, because we can look to Him as that witness. Only through Him are we able to to sever that 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 bondage that we have to our sinful nature. And we have to grab hold of that. And again, as I was starting to mention, um, we, when we try to do it all alone, and when we try to be a, a force of one, and we forget about holding on to Christ and holding on to each other, because guess what? You can spend all the time you want reading scripture in your closet, um, but you need to have other people there to set an example for you and to, to be praying for you and to holding you up and to listening to you when you've got issues and problems and, and concerns. And we need each other. We need to be the body of Christ. It's not the finger of Christ, after all. You're not to be cut off by, by, by yourself. You can't, you can't do that. I would say that, 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 that we can, you can be a Christian perhaps for one generation separated from the church, but the second generation will be gone. And I've talked about that before, that we do have a duty to the children and the grandchildren keep them in the faith and but if we don't keep them in church we don't keep them coming to church we don't keep teaching them they will fall away and guess who gets to answer for that when we get to heaven because that was a job that we were given we were, were given jobs by to do here we're given tasks to do here we battle with this imperfection that we have but the, the ultimate goal is that God uses imperfect people. He has no choice because we've already ascertained here that none of us are perfect. None of those men on that mountain in South Dakota are perfect either. And none of those men on any of those sculptures that were torn down were perfect either. Nor should the, the thing was we shouldn't have expected them to be. That wasn't the point. The point was when we went to that statue and we looked at that mountain, we look at that and we see these people that dealt with sin. They, dealt, they wrestled with imperfection their whole lives, yet God used them for good. And we can take reassurance from that and know that our lives lived for God, lived for Christ, as imperfect and as sinful as we are, can be used for good. And we will do God's work in spite of ourselves. And that's the message that we have from Paul. And again, Paul is without a doubt the most impactful person on the history of Christianity besides, besides Jesus himself. And whatever Paul was wrestling with, whatever that thorn was, whatever that sin was, we don't really know. We don't need to know because we know what our own shortcomings are, don't we? We know what we wrestle with and that's what we need to focus on in letting God overcome that and let God use us as he sees fit. So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much that you are more than capable of using your imperfect vessels that you find here in this world, those of us, to do your perfect will here in this world, Lord. And we thank you for that so very much. We just lift up our lives to you. We dedicate our lives to you uh, as flawed as they may be that out of this, this imperfection that we can contribute to your great kingdom that's coming. Pray this in the love and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.